Hey guys, today's podcast was a huge knowledge bomb, and I feel like I learned so much from my guest today. If you don't know her, she is Dr. Jess Petros, who you can also find on Instagram. She shares a lot of great information all about what happens when diet isn't working anymore for you and you're not noticing a difference when you've changed your diet. Well, did you know that stealth infections can actually be one of the causes? We talked all about how mold, pathogens, viruses, even things like SIBO can all be affecting your skin. And we also talked about things like Lyme, ozone therapy, ozone saunas, how to use that to help your skin, Gerson therapy, and different tests that are out there to help your skin get better as well. So this was one of my favorite podcasts because I just learned so much. And I think this is the first time that I've had someone on the show who talked about all of these viruses, pathogens, SIBO, and all of this information, and all about hidden infections that you can have in your body. So I've also experienced this myself personally, and so that's why I relate to it so much. And I really hope that this podcast can help you out on your journey as well. So just remember not to give up hope and that there is always something that you can find, something that you can do to help your skin. And, you know, different practitioners all have different testing methods. So sometimes it might take some trial and error to find what works best for you or even the test that works best for you to find out what's going on inside of your body. And I also just want to mention that today's podcast is sponsored by my Conqueror Dry Skin Balm and my Bath Soak as well. I am also coming out with a body wash very soon and it will be released in the New Year's. And I'm really excited about that and I hope that you'll love it as much as I do. And I've put so much effort into it as well as new products that I have coming out. Hopefully to help your skin and to help you through what you're going through. And I always choose the highest quality ingredients. And I think that's why it takes some time as well to come out with the right products. Because I want to make sure that I am sourcing it from really high quality places and ingredients. And just working with someone like a, a formulator who can really make something that will be helpful and soothing and moisturizing for your skin as well. So you can stay tuned for that or check out all of my Conqueror products at my store at eczemaconquerors.com and head to the store section. Use podcast 10 for 10% off. Also, if you want to follow me on my healing journey, you can always follow my before and after pictures and my healing tips and advice and journey at Eczema Conquerors. Uh, that's with an S and that is on Instagram and Facebook. And you can join my free Facebook community support group as well and just search for Eczema Conquerors support group. So without further ado, let's start today's podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Eczema Podcast, where you'll learn tips, products, and natural eczema remedies from Abby, registered holistic nutritionist and founder of eczemaconquerors.com. Stay tuned as she invites experts in the field. Here's your host of the Eczema Podcast, Abby. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Eczema Podcast. I have a very great guest on today who I've actually been following for a really, really long time. So I am just so excited that she is here today as my guest and she has a lot of great tips to share. She is a huge wealth of knowledge. If you aren't following her on Instagram, make sure you do and she will share her Instagram handle later. She is a functional medicine doctor who also specializes in stealth infections. So she, she specializes in things like mold and Lyme. And she's also trained in Gerson therapy, uh, ozone, cannabis as well. She has her own education courses that are live. And she just spreads so much knowledge. Even on Instagram, she shares so much information all the time. So Dr. Jess, welcome to the show. And I I am so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Abby. I really appreciate it. You, I, I'm so delighted to be on. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so honored to have you here as well. So Dr. Jess, I know that you see a lot of different patients uh, with a lot of different issues. Maybe we can go back to how you first got into becoming a functional medicine doctor and what led you to this path. Right. So um, I actually 
went to school, medical school for internal medicine, which is a, a vast different world than what I practice in now. And um, I ended up after a medical school and residency being a hospitalist, which is a doc in the hospital that basically emits everything from the emergency room from diabetic coma to heart attack. Um, we even got some elective surgeries that weren't emerging here and there. So I saw everything basically. Um, and it was super fun. And I learned a lot about emergency medicine and emergencies in general. But what I also learned was that chronic illnesses really didn't improve that much. And that they were given, you know, sometimes 30 pills on discharge and no one ever talked about diet. And I really started to see cracks in the system. And so for that reason, I thought, wow, you know, this isn't really fulfilling my soul anymore. I feel like I'm not really helping people as much as I could be. And so I decided to get trained in Gerson therapy and they really kind of ripped my eyes wide open to the truth about things like tap water and our food and even what we're cooking our food in, right? And so then I thought, wow, there's so much more I don't know. And this is actually what causes people to be sick. It's not just our genes. And with that being said, I went to root cause medicine, which is functional medicine. And here we are. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I know that you do a lot of testing on your patients as well. And and it's really neat just seeing the before and after results that you've shared. And it's so great that you've done Gerson therapy and that you are medically trained as a doctor as well. So when it comes to eczema, what sorts of root causes have you seen in some of your patients? There's a lot, right? I mean, I I, I can say that I feel like a lot of it can be heavy metals. Um, and then another reason often can be pathogens. And since I focus a lot of my time there, I like to talk about how things like mold, different types of toxic mold and mycotoxins, as well as tick associated illnesses like Lyme or babesiosis, or um, even, gosh, even SIBO, which stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. All of these can cause things like rashes, um, hives, eczema, right? Psoriasis, all these things um, help to make the immune system a little haywire because they're not supposed to be there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really, really interesting. I've actually had a lot of um, clients lately who have had SIBO. And I would love to know your thoughts on it. How do they get it? How do they fix it? Yeah. So SIBO is, is hard. Sometimes SIBO is the root cause. And sometimes I see SIBO there because someone has a bunch of pathogens and their immune system has just been lowered so much that they don't have a good defense. They don't have a good microbiome to be their defense. Right. And then everything kind of grows opportunistically like SIBO. Um, and SIBO is difficult. It's really hard. There are certain foods they can't eat. Um, lots of prebiotics like garlic and chicory really make them worse. Probiotics oftentimes make Make them worse and more bloated. So you really have a really restrictive diet. It's a low FODMAPS diet, um, which means cutting out a large portion of um, fruit and fermented foods, uh, which can increase histamine and increase rashes, rashes and itchiness in these people. So we eliminate a lot of those foods uh, and foods that kind of can be irritating to SIBO. And then you really have look at some nice um, broad spectrum antimicrobials that are herbal um, that re are really great at, at getting those um, concentration of bacteria in the small intestines that you don't want. And you really want to be careful with adding in you may want to look at spore-based probiotics for people that have SIBO too. So SIBO is um, difficult to treat and sometimes can take up to six months. Um, a lot of people ask me about rifaxin, rifaximine, which is the antibiotic that a lot of the GI docs will give patients for this. And it's super expensive, girl. It's like, I don't know, if your insurance doesn't cover it, it's like almost two or three grand. Wow. Like 50% of the time. I mean, it's like partially gets it. So mm. I prefer to do it all naturally with people, honestly. Mm, that's really interesting. So you mentioned spore biotics. So what kind of, pro how would someone find a probiotic like that? So the one that I use, and I, I just like them. I'm not getting any kickback here, but I like Megaspore probiotic. Um, and I like it because it's a spore-based one that comes from the soil. So that way it resists, it's more a little more resilient, right? When it hits the hydrochloric acid in the gut, it doesn't just dissolve. It's able to be resilient, make it to the bloodstream. And these, these don't, these more have um, bifidobacterium in them, not as much lactobacillus, which seems to feed the bacteria in the small intestines more. So if you want one of those with the Megaspore, you have 
have to have a practitioner or a full script account um, or something like that. They're not readily available for whatever reason. It's more of a upgraded pr- practitioner type of probiotic, right? Actually, my practitioner also just recommended Megaspore Biotics. So I'm actually really interested in trying it. Um, I do have a practitioner account to try it. So I'm interested and I'll let you know how it goes as well. Take it at night. So it, like the two caps just sit in your gut mm-hmm. all night long. You'll mm-hmm. love it. Cool. Um, and then for SIBO, can people self-diagnose themselves or? Sometimes. I have... I definitely had really aware patients that come in and say, you know, I'm fairly certain that I'm suffering from SIBO and the gold standard is a breath test, right? To look for methane and hydrogen elevations. But a lot of times these people are connected enough to their body. They already know it. They're like, I have this weird fermented taste in my mouth and they'll know, like, they'll be like, my breath is weird. And then they'll say things like, it feels like I'm pregnant you know, I'm so distended. I'm so bloated. It hurts. Mm -hmm. And that really is very indicative of SIBO-like symptoms. They'll, they'll often know that if they eat fruit, it sits like an anvil in their gut. And, and that's just the awareness of some people that those are really sensitive signs for a SIBO-like picture. And I'm guessing like, even if they eat a small bit of food, like sometimes they can also feel really full. I'm guessing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Some of them, it doesn't really matter about the fruit. It's gotten to a point where it's just anything they put in their gut, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The longer it sits in peristalsis is sluggish. It doesn't move forward. The more it can putrefy and ferment in the gut. And that's where that fruity, weird fermented taste to their breath comes from. I, I've actually been, uh, I just listened to Dr. Mark Hyman. He was actually talking about how when a lot of foods ferment, it can create auto brewery syndrome now. So people are getting pulled over for drunk driving um, because, <laughs> because of that. Al- it creates alcohol uh, without them drinking alcohol. Yes, absolutely. And and also not just that, but you know, you got to think if something sits in ferments and, and in the gut, it can form um, acetaldehyde, which also candida forms in our gut, right? And that can cross the blood brain barrier and make us feel kind of almost drunk a little bit. So if you definitely, almost everyone with SIBO has some sort of candida element too. It's really common for both of those frenemies to be together. Um, and then you're really talking about things that you're craving fermented foods. Things are fermenting your gut. They're sitting so long. So it can be a compounded problem for people for sure. And it's no wonder why the skin is flaring because all this bacteria and then it also gets into the blood and creates uh, can create fatty liver as well. So, yeah. So um, is your recommendation mainly um, an antimicrobial and then also like certain foods that they have to eat? Yeah, it's like, it's a little bit of a restrictive diet for a certain amount of time. And then I really like... Um, things like, um, biocidin, which is liquid. So it's, and it's bio more bioavailable since it's liposomal. Um, I really like that. It covers a broad spectrum of things, including SIBO. Um, there's some nice products out there for SIBO though. Honestly, you want to look for things like acrylic acid extract. Um, you know, there's a lot of black walnut hull, um, echinacea. There's a lot of things that can really help. Um, with SIBO, digestive enzymes, really important. Bitters, really important. Um, I actually prefer bitters so that you make your own digestive enzymes, right? That bitter taste mm. like your salivary glands. Mm. Um, that really helps. You have to have a digestive fire, enough hydrochloric acid here to break things down or they'll sit, right? They'll just sit heavy. That's true. I actually just bought, um, I just bought Organic Olivia's Digestive Bitters. I had a brand new one on the table and then my husband put the groceries on the table and then the whole bottle just fell on the floor and broke and it was a brand new bottle. And then you cried. Yeah. I was so sad. That's a good one. I like, I have hers in my kitchen too. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I love her stuff. Um, Okay. So let's move on to pathogens or is that, uh, does that fall under SIBO as well? Or I guess... SIBO is a mix of pathogens. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would love to talk about pathogens that you found. I know that you do your GI map stool test. Um, So I would love to know about what things you found in terms of pathogens and all that good stuff. 
So the GI map, for anyone who doesn't know, is made by Diagnostic Solutions. It's um, a specialty test that uses a polymerase chain reaction or PCR, which is DNA. It's analyzing DNA in our stool um, to see um, what we can find. It's almost like a like a fingerprint of your microbiome, right? It's your own unique signature and bacteria, which you have billions in your gut, right? So they take ones that um, we can are able to track. Things like, um, you know, the first page of the GI map is really pathogenic stuff. It's stuff like Clostridium difficile or C. diff, which is a really, it's only be in hospitals, guys, but now antibiotic use is so rampant that we're catching it in the population too. And it causes a lot of bloating and diarrhea and pain. Um, I've caught that on the GI map. I've caught um, cholera on the GI map. I've caught enterohemorrhagic E. coli on the GI map. Uh, let's see, I've caught definite parasites, definitely caught a worm or two on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Candida is one that hides pretty well, but we've definitely caught candida on there. Um, it's, it's wild. The stuff Giardia. Giardia is a parasite that t- traditionally you get from drinking out of streams. If you're camping or something, I've caught that in just people who have no idea where this comes from. Their guts are just a mess and there you'll catch some surprises on there. Absolutely. So I know, um, uh, my other naturopath that, um, that I've uh, been working with a lot. She says that she sees a lot of infections on the GI map stool test. Yep. Absolutely. Oh yeah, you definitely, you definitely catch all of that on there. And the most interesting part of the test for me is actually the last part of the test. It's intestinal health. And it basically tells you if you're making gluten antibodies, if um, you have blood in your stool, how much inflammation is in your gut. Um, If you have leaky gut, it checks sonulin. Um, If you have enough soldier cells in your mucous membranes and gut. So it's actually a really amazing test for, for doctors to kind of get a whole picture of gut health. And I know a lot of people are going to ask this, but um, I know the price can be expensive, but would you mind letting our viewers know how much um, the GI map stool tests is and maybe also even the SIBO test? So the SIBO test, you know, I'm not exactly sure because there's a number of different labs you can do a breath test through. So I don't think that one is too much, maybe $100, $200. The GI map, unfortunately, is $359, um, which is still a really reasonable price for how much you get on this test. If you guys could see it, it's like a 10, 15-page printout, and it's jam-packed full of information. So, um, And, you know, all the Great Plains lab tests that do mold and all that stuff are the same way as well. So they're expensive. They're about $300, $400, but they give you so much information that just normal blood tests are lacking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true. I think it would reveal so much. Um, so how do you usually, I guess, what's your usually plan of action after you see the GI map? And I know it depends because it depends what kind of bacteria is in there. But yeah, what's your course of action once you do those tests? It's hard because it, it totally depends on what's going on. But one of the most important things for me is the secretory IgA level. And that's the one I was talking about, how much, how many soldier cells are in your gut membrane. Um, so depend depending on what that number is, I usually give them something like a colostrum or a glandular colostrum to rebuild that. Because if I see that's in the toilet, then whatever pathogens they have there, I can kill and kill and kill, but they don't have enough soldier cells there to mount a response. So the path almost, they don't have a you don't have soldier cells to protect you there. So that's one of the most important things that I'll replace immediately if it's in the toilet um, is is the secretory IgA. And that requires colostrum or a glandular colostrum if you don't want the dairy. Um, and then, you know, definitely looking at some of the pathogens. I really love biocidin. I usually, that's sort of my go-to for any, any pathogens that I see there because I know it's so broad spectrum and I know everyone can absorb it even if they have an inflamed leaky gut. Um, and then depending on if the pathogen has a biofilm or not, and a lot of them do, most of them do, right? And mm-hmm. especially depending on what shape it is. If it's something that's corkscrew, corkscrew shaped like H. pylori, which the GI map also checks for, that one hides really well. It's the same shape as Lyme, so it can burrow into tissues like your gastric lining um, and hide so well from your body's defenses. So it needs to be kind of bound out of air. You can't 
just kill it off. It's hidden too well in the tissues and it's in a biofilm. So it's almost invisible to your body's defenses somewhat. So you have to give something to remove the biofilm. That's a killing agent, a biofilm buster. And then you have to think about a binder, which goes deep in the tissues and is able to pull things, right? Um, binders are negatively charged. A lot of heavy metals and pathogens can end up in a positively charged, charged uh, cation conglomerate. And so it makes sense how the binders can pull deep. So if you found something with a biofilm or something that's shaped like a corkscrew and can burrow, you really want to consider a binder after the biocidin or whatever you decide to take for it. GI Microbe X by Designs for Health is also a great product if people can digest capsules. Um, and then binders are things like activated charcoal, zeolite clay, um, apple pectin, silica, amazing stuff. And then um, really for most people, I, I really get onto people. I'm like, why aren't you sweating every day? Your um, kill buying sweat protocol, right? <laughs> that, you're, that you're known for. <laughs> people are like, what do you mean? How long do I have to sweat? And I'm like, no, why aren't you sweating any, every day anyway? If you're able to move your body, it's such an honor. And you should because that's a detox pathway. And people tell me they don't poop for all week long. They don't sweat. And I, I can't fix them until I could get them doing those things. So what happens when people can't sweat? Because people tell me all the time, I can't sweat, I exercise, I still can't sweat. Amen, sister. It's like one of the questions I ask people now, do you sweat? They look at me crazy. I'm like, no, really? (laughs) Because you're right. And what that happens is when I hear that from people is that first, they haven't exercised their ability to exercise, right? Or sweat every day. So that channel has been able to be kind of blocked off because they haven't been proactive about taking care of their body as well. And on top of that, if you have hidden pathogens or any sort of gut dysfunction, any sort of gut associated pathogen, then you're looking at very smart Um, bacterial and viral creatures that have evolved with us for millions of years. They're smart. All right. They're smart and they can block out certain pathways, just like the sweat pathway. They can make bile thick and sludgy and it doesn't freely flow. That's a detox pathway. They can actually, the viruses hide in the liver. That's, they can stunt the liver and lie dormant there. That absolutely is a detox pathway. So if you're over time, not able to sweat like you were when you were younger, that is a warning sign from the body that something is not performing correctly anymore. Right. Can viruses also cause um, blood sugar issues like prediabetes or uh, inflammation like that? Yeah, absolutely. We actually think that type 1 diabetes is a viral infection that oh, causes, wow. yeah, is a, is a post-autoimmune type of reaction. Um, absolutely. Epstein-Barr is connected to so many issues, thyroid problems, um, even certain cancers, right? Um herpes virus, or excuse me, hepatitis virus is absolutely known to cause liver cancer. So, you know, these things definitely can cause autoimmune issues and cancers. And I think we are barely scratching the surface about what we know with that. That's why I'm, I'm finding that it's so important to look into viruses, fungal issues, um, bacteria, because like you mentioned, sometimes uh, looking at the food is not really enough. Um, we need to dig deeper, like you mentioned. And so I think that it's so great that you're looking, you're doing all these tests and and you're working with people to investigate. Thank you so much. It's really rewarding, actually, because when you set out to be a doctor or practitioner, you want to help people. That's your goal. You want to feel good because you help people. And so this just helps me help people. And I love, yeah, I love that about you, that you're actually such a caring doctor and, you know, you just want to see people get better and you can really tell when, you know, I hear the information that you share. So I'm so thankful for all that you're doing. Um, And for your Gerson therapy and ozone, do you use that when it comes to eczema or? You know, yes, I'll tell you what, I had um, someone... I actually had two cases back when I used to work in Irvine of people coming in with some of the worst psoriasis head to toe I've ever seen and eczema as well. And we either, at that time we didn't have ozone. So we did hyperbaric oxygen chambers, which is a similar concept of hyperoxygenating the body. And it really resolved everything for them. Um, and I really loved topical CBD bombs that don't have any toxic anything in them um, for things like skin rashes and autoimmune conditions like that. They're really pretty gentle for most people. Um, and so that's a really nice adjuvant thing that I use. Yeah. How does ozone work? I've actually looked into some of the machines. I know they're not that expensive, but how do you choose a good machine? Because there's so many out there. 
That's a great question. So unfortunately, there's some regulations in the United States where they don't allow proper manufacturing and um, of the highest quality ozone machines because they tried to make it sort of illegal. And so they blocked that technology. So the best companies are actually um, Longevity out of Canada. And um, then there's... Uh, Pure O3 as well. And um, they make some great uh, generators, ozone generators. And the machines are probably, you know, I'd say a couple feet, two or three feet tall and wide. They hang on your wall. Um, it's just really, you need an oxygen tank to hook up to it. And when you filter the O2 through the ozone generator, it converts it to O3. So you can hear it. It kind of makes a buzzing noise when it's converting. Um, and then basically, if you want to do IV ozone, you probably need to go to a practitioner's office. But they take a quart of blood, pint of blood out, um, excuse me, and then we'll push ozone into the bag of blood, swish it around. And it'll turn bright red right there in front of you and drip it back into your vein. I've heard amazing things about, about the IV one. Um, I, I haven't heard or I, I don't know of many people who have tried the other ozone. Which one do you find more effective? So there's ozone insufflation. So you can actually do rectal and vaginal insufflations with oh. ozone. And that's another way to do it. Yeah. And that one actually, studies show you can get almost equal blood levels of ozone that way because the tissue down there has so vascularized that it absorbs pretty readily um, just from holding the, the gas there. Wow. Does it hurt? <laughs> no, it, it kind of can have a weird sensation for some people. It doesn't hurt though, but you can imagine how good it is if there's a tumor there, you know, um, some sort of, you know, female reproductive tumor or, you know, some sort of other tumor in the GI tract. It really is beneficial for people. And then um, the other way to use it is ozone sauna, um, which I have. It's lovely. I I might have seen you post it before on your stories. I can't remember. But um, I've actually, I've been wanting to look into ozone sauna. Uh, I've heard it's better than a regular sauna, if I'm correct. Well, you know, it's a steam sauna and your head's out because you don't want to, ozone is a respiratory irritant. So they have this part sealed, mm -hmm. um, but basically ozone can diffuse into the skin too. It's a gas and it's a steam sauna um, and they're just pumping ozone into it um, and your head sealed. So it's really great. It's actually hard to stay in for 30 minutes. Um, wow. It really is. Yeah. Is it just cold or is it just No, you're, you're hot. You'll start oh. sweating on mm -hmm. your forehead. And um, yeah, sometimes it can be like, you know, you're, you're kind of closed off. So you're a little claustrophobic, right? Um, so it's hard to stay still, but it's amazing. It works amazing. So the ozone, even if you do it in sauna form, it has the same effect as IV where it just kills the bacteria. And so, I don't think there's actually enough studies done on the ozone sauna to be able to say that what levels are achieved in the blood yet. Um, I do know that I've had many uh, clients order the sauna, especially the people with Lyme and mold do do really well with the sauna it really, really well. So it's wonderful for self infections. Um, and any sort of, you know, usually I feel like eczema, psoriasis, things like that. Self infections are a big cause of why that can happen. So it can be beneficial all the way around. That's great to know. And it's, it's so sad because I've met a lot of people who have, you know, turned to um, long-term medication because they, they don't know that, you know, viruses and bacteria can actually be a cause. So they haven't looked into it. Exactly. It's true because nobody's, not even the doctors are properly educated about this, unfortunately. You know, reg regular MDs, unless they're Lyme literate, still often don't believe in chronic Lyme disease. So it's really, it's a problem with education all the way around. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. So how do you implement Gerson therapy as well for people with eczema? Because I know a lot of cancer patients use it and it's really effective. I would love to know how it works as well. So it's a really intensive therapy. I don't know if I just recommend it for eczema at all because it's so intensive. The aggressive Gerson therapy is 13 juices a day and five coffee enemas. And that's because it's an alternative for cancer treatment for, for clients. Um, you know, and these are people who decide on their own that they chemotherapy, radiation, that whole kind of route isn't for them. So they decide they want to try something holistic and pretty intensive. And it's hard because it doesn't get any easier over the two year program. It's the same thing. You wake up every day, making fresh juices almost every hour and doing enemas throughout the day. It's even hard to have a job, but obviously because you're putting like 
you know, wonderful nu- organic nutrients in, you're detoxing bad things out through the liver with coffee enemas. And then oftentimes we'll even give thyroid replacement to speed up metabolism. So if anyone has any sort of eczema or any other skin, anything, it's pretty readily cleared. Um, oftentimes people will have a little bit of a healing detox reaction and it can actually come out and get worse and spread the first, you know, week to month on the program. And then you hit that ceiling and everything gets better, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) How it works. Wow. That is really intense. And I think if I remember correctly, it's coupled with eating a lot of raw veggies. It is. It's pretty much a vegan diet. It's a lot of soups and mixed salads, um, cooked potatoes, things like that. But it's, um, they often do incorporate, um, other proteins. Sometimes if people have parasympathetic cancers, they will give certain clean um, meats or proteins and they often, they always have glandulars. So, you know, maybe adrenal glandular replacement, beef liver tabs, things like that. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Wow. Um, so what other stealth infections do you see and, you know, how do you treat those other ones? So it's, oh man, it's difficult. There's so many, I guess probably the thing that I see the most, um, nowadays, and it's probably just because of my education that I put out there, but everyone who's got mold is coming to see me and mold is a root cause issue that's been overlooked and really the public has been misinformed. Um, also I treat so much sick building syndrome. So, you know, any sort of, there's bacteria that produce lipopolysaccharides, um, and endotoxins as well as mold that produces chemical warfare agents and volatile organic compounds. And these things are much worse in, in newer homes that aren't quite built the same as some of the, even older homes can be toxic too, obviously. But I see so many people who are sick because of where they live where they live. And that's, that's, that's so that's, sad. Yeah. Isn't it awful? Mm-hmm. And that's the hidden infection. So more and more these days, that's kind of what I'm treating. I, I see everything though. I see every tick associated illness, ehrlichiosis, babesiosis, Bartonella, which is cat scratch fever. Um, I see CMV, which is cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, I've seen mycoplasma. I mean, there's all these exotic infections that a lot of people don't understand. Like mycoplasma, for example, is connected to rheumatoid arthritis. So there's a reason people are sick. Wow. Well, I'm really curious about the sick building syndrome. I know that when a lot of people are working, there can be a lot of mold in some like buildings as well. But very interested in sick building syndrome, how you mentioned that like some newer buildings or even like old ones and houses can have a lot of chemicals that can be affecting people. I think we're probably, you might be the first to hear this, are going to have a um, whole course on how to properly remediate a house with mold. Um, so that probably is coming or not just mold, but sick building syndrome in general, because you have to think all the things they're replacing in new houses. Now, the laminate floors, the hardwood floors, the carpets, they're full of flame retardants, VOCs. And we put new furniture in there with it on there too, that off gases the whole time. Then we have Teflon that off gases that can kill parakeets in studies, by the way. So there's all these toxic things in the house. And then it also matters where you set the house. Is there rising damp there? What does the foundation look like on top of that? If anything ever overflows or leaks in the house, mold can grow in 24 hours. There was also a study recently, well, not recently, 2005, in environmental perspectives that showed that 67% of adult onset asthma developed after workers worked in a water damaged building. Wow, that's crazy. I am so impressed with the amount of knowledge that you know about like viruses and mold and like water damage. It's just, I feel like not a lot of people are touching upon it today. It's true. I actually um, did have a blog post all about how I connected every single mood or mental disorder nearly to a hidden infection. And this was these were scientific studies that went along with it that show people aren't just mentally unstable for no reason, um, especially if it developed later in life. There really needs to be, you know, look at autistic children. Their guts are now being shown to be, you know, really infested with you know, parasites and Lyme and everything else. And that's often the connection is the microbiome again, just like to eczema, right? So Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very fascinating for sure. I even saw you posted recently about how one of your clients had like Ashley furniture and then they got really sick from even just like a sofa. Yeah, absolutely. I describe it. It helps people understand by saying maybe 
you have a toxin bucket we're all born with. And some people's are more full than other people's. And so hers, she's had a fuller toxin bucket. So when she put a new couch in her in her house, it was full of those flame retardants that were just made that bucket overflow at that point, And she couldn't handle any more toxicities in her environment. And I always say to people that eczema is just a symptom and there can be something deeper that's going on. Like you mentioned, virus, bacteria, SIBO, candida. And I know it can be overwhelming for people at first. So how do they decide what tests to start with? You know, I really love uh, Great Plains Lab Organic Acids Test. That test is a urine test. It's about $300. Um, And it looks, it's sort of like, it's like Seinfeld. It's still amazing though. So it's it's the show about nothing, right? This is the test about nothing. But it tells you everything. It tells you kind of what rabbit hole to go down once you get it. So it looks at things like um, a handful of markers for mold. Uh, a couple markers for candida. It looks for clostridium. It looks at neurotransmitters. It looks at nutritional deficiencies. It looks at ketone fatty acid oxidation, mitochondrial damage. So there's just a little bit of fatty acids, um, everything, everything. So there's a little bit of everything on this test and we can see what section is the weak area for each client um, and basically know where to go deeper if need be after that. So that test is just sort of a great starting point in general for people. Thank you. That's so interesting. Now, um, I know we've talked about so much information. Um, I guess, do you have any last pieces of advice or, I guess, tips for someone who's just dealing with full-blown eczema and they just don't know where to start or where to go? You know, start with your diet, guys. It's so, I know you guys have all talked about this, but it's so much linked to dairy and processed inflammatory foods. So, really cut out inflammatory foods, you know, start with your diet. And that may not be enough, like we said earlier, for a lot of people. So, at that point, you need to look and see if there's toxicities in the body that need to be removed. Do you, are you living a life full of toxic household cleaners and endocrine disruptors that need to be moved out? You know, are you living in a sick building? Have you, do you have mercury fillings and maybe have mercury toxicity, right? right? Do you have um, a bunch of illnesses in your past or you're always sick or you have brain fog and joint pains and that sounds like a hidden infection, right? So you need to start asking yourself these questions and then don't let anyone tell you that you're crazy because most of my patients come to me after they've seen a dozen doctors and everyone said, we don't know what's wrong with you. I know it's it can be so overwhelming for people who go through this. Um, so if people are interested in seeing you, do you always start with uh, some sort of test that they have to do? No, actually, I don't usually go to that step at all unless people really are adamant about wanting to be tested right out of the gate. Um, the majority of my first appointment is spent an hour, hour and a half gathering history. So I have a pretty good idea myself of what I think is going on. I may not know the specific infection necessarily, unless it's mold, but a lot of the other things I'll know, I'll just say there's a hidden infection present and that will let me know maybe if we want to test what tests we should order. Um, But you know, sometimes I'll, I'll talk to people and it, it doesn't sound like a hidden infection. It sounds maybe like they've had you know, some hormonal issues and I need to focus on that. You know, have they had endocrine disruptors in their life, right? Um, or their pesticides in their life. And so getting a good history helps me save patients money because I am cutting down on how many tests I would need because I did my due diligence. Actually, you're right. Um, even in the intake form they do, like it can reveal so much about, you know, where their root cause could be, you know, which route they should take. And so I really love that you're doing such a detailed history important. It really is. Yeah. You know, dermatologists only do like 15, 15, 20 minutes. I can't figure out half of what I need to figure out in that time. I just cannot. Yeah, for sure. Um, so if people are interested in seeing you, how would they do that? So I work at Nourish Medical Center, um, nourishmedicalcenter.com in Sorrento Valley in San Diego, California. And we do video and phone consults as well. So um, everyone can see me. I'm booked out, I think, till February, but then you can come see me. Uh, Also, I'm very active online under a doctor period, DR period, Jess period, Petros, which is my last name, P-E-A-T-R-O-S-S on Instagram. Um, And you guys can find me there. And then you'll also see a link in my bio there if you're interested in my live education. And we are going to be having um, rollouts of that as well, too. So stay tuned. And are you doing that regular on a regular basis or is there a certain launch period? 
I am actually, it's, um, it's every Tuesday night. Um, and so people can, even if you miss the first two live weeks, they're recorded and we can send the recording out to you. So you can still, um, get the whole course, obviously. And, you know, the course is, it, um, priced at about a thousand dollars. It was on a pre-sale with half off, but if you're interested, um, in just buying the videos singly, we will be selling those at a much discounted rate. So and, you know, I know you only scratched the surface today, but just imagine like the, the other amount of knowledge that you have in your courses. It must be a lot. It's a lot because I'm on here basically on Zoom with a PowerPoint, like teaching people for an hour. And then there's a half an hour Q&A afterwards every time. So people really not only get to hear me teach, but they get access to me, too. So that I think I'm hoping that's helpful for everyone. So thank you so much, Dr. Jess. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was really lovely. Thanks for listening to the Eczema Podcast. And stay tuned for our next episode. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass it along to your friends. Visit eczemaconquerors.com for more articles and tips. Thanks for listening.